Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our session today on manipulating and cleaning data. My name is Moria and I'm the Reactor Program Manager based in Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, today's session is going to be presented by Bethany Jemchumba. She's one of our gold student ambassadors. Um, the session will be, um, will be delivered here on YouTube. It will be recorded. It will be available for you later in case you will want to uh, watch it again later or you're going to miss some of it. Um, we also encourage you to make it an interactive session. So please feel free to use the comments uh, tab to ask questions and Bethany will take the time to answer your questions um, at the end of her presentation. Um, I will be also here um, helping uh, to moderate this session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to post them. And also please feel free to let us know where you're joining us from today. I see that already John said he's coming, he's joining from New Jersey. So hi, John. Um, hi, everyone. And we hope you enjoy this session. Bethany, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me today. So I'll be taking you through manipulating and cleaning your data. Uh, before we, got, we get into the code, I'll start with uh, an explanation and an overview of what we'll be covering today and what the data science process is, and then we'll get to the code. Okay. So the objectives of this session is first to understand what the data process, the data science process is, what you do with your data, and how do you get from your data, cleaning it and uh, exporting it to be used? Then we'll also be now dealing with importing your data, exploring what the contents of your data is. And the two main things we'll be covering is dealing with missing and duplicate data, then finalizing on uh, merging your data together and getting to your visualizations. So all the links for the sessions are here. So I'll probably just paste them on the chat for you to go through them. I'll, okay, sorry. I'll paste them on the chat in a few minutes for you to go through them. Then the last thing that will be, so let's get to the data science process. Uh, data science is all about finding insights from data and making, using, making sense of it and using it either in your model, in making your decisions for your business, etc. So the first step is to identify what the data means to the business. For you to be able to now do all the data science, the data wrangling, cleaning your data, you first have to understand why this data is important, what the business needs this data for. Then go ahead and understand now the data. You How will you be collecting the data and review what data you have. After you now have a deep understanding of what you need to do with the data, and the data, the next step is preparing your data. Most data out there is dirty. Sometimes you'll get duplicates, sometimes they're missing data. So it's very important for you to prepare your data. And then after your data is well prepared, well cleaned, you get to the modeling part. We won't be covering modeling or evaluation or deployment today, but this is just uh, nice to know. So we'll be modeling your data, making sense of it, and then doing an evaluation of your data, so your model, evaluating uh, what the model is, what its inputs are, what its outputs are, and also the accuracy of your model. And then from there, you can tweak your data to make better decisions. And uh, so after you model your data, you evaluate the model created to make it better. And then after you've done your evaluation, you deploy your data. The model. So by deploying, it's now ready to use by the business. Okay, so let's get to the coding. Uh, let me share the link on the chat in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay, as I share the link, I'll be switching my screen to the to the code a uh, minute. So we get to the code and then I get to share the link. Uh -huh.
So in the link that I'll just be dropping on the chat, you'll get everything you need from, uh, so you'll get the current uh, notebook that I'm working on, and also you'll be able to get the presentation and the links in the presentation. So let's get started. So I'll be using uh, GIP, uh, Azure Visual Studio Code. No, I'll be using Visual Studio Code for the for our code demo. And the first thing I'm doing the demo from here, then the code is already there. So I'll just be doing writing them down and guiding you through each and every step of the code. But yeah, so let's begin. So the first thing is to import your data. And in importing your data, we normally use a library called pandas. So the first thing to do is importing pandas. Oh, I have so many screens open. Okay, so the first thing is to import pandas as me. And then from where will we be getting our data set? We'll be getting our data set from Bethany, can you just sorry? Can you just share the link um, at the comments? I saw some people were asking for it. I think you showed it before, but yeah, can you make share the link? Okay. Yeah. Oh, a comment. Oh, oh, yeah. No, I can't comment on. Uh, you can put it in the comments. Yeah, I've added the link there again. Is that okay? Um. No, perhaps you can send it to me and I can paste it there. Okay, let me, yeah, let me send you the link. So uh, there's a link. From that link, you'll be able to get the code and also the presentation. So all the links are listed there on the description or the readme, whichever one you choose. Okay, I think that's it, right? Yes, I shared it now. It's fine. Thank you. Okay. So from now, we've imported pandas. So our data set is in scikit-learn. So we have to import it directly from scikit-learn data set. So what you do is uh, import uh, slan slan dot data sets. And then we'll be loading Sorry, so from our data set from SKLAN, we'll be loading the Iris data set. So we import and then from there we get our data set. So we've imported the library that we'll be using for our data set. And then the next thing is importing the data set, the data set that we'll be using. From there, now we load our Iris data set. So pandas, most of the when we import data in pandas, the data imported is in data frames. So I'll use DF to represent our data frame. And then our data frame will be load underscore. One that we imported. And then now reading the data, right? So from Iris, from the data frame, we get td dot data frame so using the pandas so we we, we had loaded pandas as pd so pd data frame then our data will well sorry our data will be iris which will oh i'm so sorry <laughs> i normally use a different notebook for this so our data will be iris. So we get it from iris, we get the data. And then so, so we're getting the data from iris. And what now are our columns that we'll be using? So we'll be using the columns, which are is equals to the iris feature names. So let me put them. I is uh, 
Okay, so that's now our data. So that's we've loaded our data in into the df dot uh, load iris and then hmm, iris is not defined. Oh yeah, df. Okay. So from there we can be able to I'm so sorry for the errors. So we can be able to now get our data frame. So the there are three things that we need to do when importing our data. The first thing is to understand the different columns our data has. So the first thing is data df.info to be able to read the data frame and understand the different columns we have, the different rows we have. From, so from here we can see we have um, four rows and in these four rows they are all in centimeters. So they give us the length and the width of the sepals and the petals of the flowers. So iris is a data, it's a data set about flowers. And when you're talking about flowers, it's about the length of the sepals and the petals, and also the width of the sepals and the petals. So we want to understand the different type of flowers. So we also check and we can see that we have no null values and our data type is a float. Okay, so from there, let's now get to check the first five rows in our data frame. So data dot head, and uh, from there we can be able to just get the five rows and see how it looks like. So this is how the past five rows look like in our data. Then if you want to check the bottom set of the data set, you go to df dot tail. So you can be able to now check what are the last set of values that we have. So this is from the column 145 to 149. And you can see the different values that we have, same to the first five rows. Okay, so if you have any questions, be sure to post them there. So from there, now we have an understanding of how our data looks like. So I'll go back to my initial notebook to explain the next part. Uh -huh. Okay, so there's a problem with my VS code. Okay. Okay, let me just uh, say it as it is. So once you're done uh, reading your data, the real world data is normally messy. It's not like this is just a dummy data set. So you can be able to just check everything is clean, everything is there. But in, when you're dealing with real world data, it's normally more messier and it's harder to, it's actually, uh, it needs a lot of cleaning to go around. So we'll create our own examples to understand the different things that we need to clean, the different things that we need to sort out. So for the first part, we are going to work with uh, null values. So what if you have any missing data in your data set? In Python, we have two types of null values. So there's none and none. So there's none and there is none. So none is basically not a number. So this is for missing values that are not float of the type float. And none is for the missing values that are of the type float. So if we create our own example, for instance, we can do example one, example one, and then we create our own dummy data. So how will our own dummy data look like? So we need to have null values and also we need to have uh, values that are also present. So the first thing is we'll create a series. And then from the series, we can now have the values. So we can have one, four, 65, and then none, none. And probably in the middle we have 52 and probably some strings. And then, yeah. So from there, we can be able to. Oh, nine is not defined, so I can't use nine. Okay, so yeah, that's the data that we have. Um, yep. So since nine is not an integer, you can't be able to use it. And then from there, the next step is now to check the missing values. The if the values are null or they're not there. 
So there are two ways to check. So you can do example underscore one and check is null. So using is null, you can be able to, it gives you a Boolean output, which you can be able to tell whether it's null, whether it's true or false. So if it is null, it is true. If it is not null, it is obviously false. If you want to do the inverse, so you can do example one into, oh, sorry, uh, not null, and then it will also give you a Boolean output. So this is the output that you get. Okay, so that's that's it about uh, checking for null values. So if you have any questions, feel free to post them on the chat. I'll be here to answer them. So that's it about checking the null values. So you have null values. How do you then deal with them? The first thing is you can be able to drop them. So when dropping null values, you use drop now. So you use example underscore one to drop now. This will help you drop null values. You see, we have the null value dropped. It was the third value, and we see there's a missing value here. So with drop now, you can be able to use different ways. So this, you, you have realized, is just dropping the whole row. So let's say we had a data frame. So let's create a data frame. Example two will be a data frame. Data frames, as I've said, is um, then we can create our own dummy data. So we have uh, two, four, mm -hmm. and then we also have another set, which will be um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, my set is complete. So you have this data frame that we've created and we want to drop null values. So I think I should have added a null values here. Oh, sorry. So adding the null value here and also, so to be able to read the null values that I was talking about. So none, as I said, is not a number. So non float values. So you'll have to use NumPy. I've not imported NumPy in my, in my notebook yet, so I'll have to import NumPy. So import NumPy as NP. And then I create now the non, the non value, so NP.none. Then from there, you can be able to now, let's check if we can be able to drop the values and what values will be dropped. So let's first read what example two the output will bring. So example two, what is our output? This is how the output looks like. The next thing is to check um, what if you want to drop the null values. So example two dot drop null. See, so I've dropped the null values. I've realized this is an issue that I have not added an index. So I'll need to set an index. So this is uh, has set itself as an index. So I'll have to figure out a way to remove that and add another index. So that will mean I'll have to add two brackets here to remove the output that it's giving me. So if I go to example two, the output is different. Then I can be able to drop the values and by dropping, it's dropping the, with the NumPy, uh, the, no, with the Python, yeah, the pandas drop a uh, library uh, function, it drops the whole row. So now you've seen, uh, I initially, because it wasn't divided into they weren't uh, grouped into the same row. We still had some values retained. But now since they're all in the same row, so the whole row is, we don't have any data that is retained. So to check, uh, to be able to check, Dropna has different ways you can be able to determine what values to drop, what values to retain. So to be able to check this, you can use example, uh, example two, 
so it should drop now and then have a question mark at the end and it can tell you the different methods to use uh, so you can be able to check so you can use either an axis so with an axis you determine so mm -hmm, let me give an example before i get to that so example two uh, drop now and then i'm dropping the axis which axis do i want to drop if i drop axis one it will be the output it will just be dropping the columns so i'll have i'll be able to retain these two columns so using the drop na question and then question mark you can be able to see the different uh, ways you can be able to determine what will be dropped what will not be dropped so with this i'm only dropping the column so that as i said the default is dropping the rows and when you use this you'll only be dropping the columns okay so any questions uh, before i continue okay so no questions i think so we'll continue with the next part so uh how do you apply this in the real life so for instance if you have if you're working with uh students data and with this students data you want to determine whether performance in math or english is performed better better depending on the gender so one of our main one of our main determinants is the gender. So in case we have someone who filled the survey and didn't indicate their gender or didn't or was or preferred not to say their gender, we 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 can't use that data to be able to help us uh, finalize on the analysis. So if we have that, if that identifier is not there, we'll have to drop the data for that. So anyone who has the uh, uh, missing gender data, we'll have to drop the whole column and just retain the ones that have. Okay, so that's about drop now. So we've talked about how to determine the null values and then how to drop them. The next thing is duplicate values. So the duplicate values, you'll have, you'll use the duplicate, duplicated to determine. If I go to back to example two, example, and then I check if there's any duplicates. I'll come and check duplicate. I'll use the method duplicated. And then as I can see from here, none of the values are duplicated. So maybe I can create another example. Mm -hmm. Example three. Uh, PD dot data frame. And then so which values do I want to use? So probably I want to use names of people and the roles that they have. So probably I'll use uh, John, then Mary, then uh, Peter, who else? Then let's say Sadhu, a fourth one, Brenda. And then from there I can now uh, created another um, another column so uh -huh. maybe i can write about the age so probably uh, john is 23 mary is 40, 34 556 and brenda is 12. and from there i can now write probably something that can eliminate them if it's duplicated so if we were to do a survey and then I wanted to get only one or two people who had the same character, so I can say if uh, John is tall, Mary is uh, short, and then I can say Peter is average of weight, of height, and then mm -hmm, of average height, and then and lastly, Brenda is let's say 12. So I'll, and I only want one category of um, people. So let's first see what our example will give us as the output. Example three. 
Oh, there's an error. Okay, uh, type object is not scrapable. Uh, I have no idea what the error is. So maybe I'll just revert to numbers. So probably a, we, we had a competition and I don't want to have the numbers of the people repeated. So let me just give them numbers as identifiers. Still not working, I have no idea why. Okay, let's just uh, go back with this. And then let me repeat the number 23 on one person. Ah, I have no idea why. So let me just go back to example two and uh, probably just uh, use the same values there and duplicate mm -hmm. example one. Yeah, let me just go to example two and then use the same values and uh, make some of them duplicates. So, uh -huh. so instead of none, I have 32 repeated here. And then instead of none, I have uh, four here. Uh -huh. So example two. Yeah, so now I have some duplicates here. So if I go to example, example underscore two, and then check for duplicates. So that will be duplicated. And then I can be able to check, yes. So none of them are duplicated. So it's checking by the rows. So I'll have to have probably the same value duplicated here. So I can, you can tell me the same, whether the values are duplicated or not. So maybe I can, it gives me the values of the rows that are duplicated. Maybe I can redo it again. And once I check, I can be able to now see the, the duplicate there. Then the next step is to drop duplicates. So how do you drop the duplicates that you have in your data set? So it will be example two, then drop duplicates. And then from there, I can now be able to drop the duplicates that was there. So from here on, when you're checking for duplicates, you can be able to now narrow down on what type of duplicates you want to check on and also narrow down on So yeah, for when you're checking on duplicates, you can be able to see, I've been able to check the duplicates per the rows and then I've been able to drop the duplicates in the missing row. So you can also be able to now check the duplicates per a specific uh, area. So this will mean I'll have to create another example or so, but with this example, I'll now have to have them have their own uh, have their own title per the example. So if I'm having, I'll now not create uh, the data frame that I created earlier, but I'll be creating it like a dictionary. So if I'm creating a PD dot data frame, I'll create a data frame, but with a different uh, twist. So mm -hmm. so that I can be able to give them they are so I can be able to give them their specific uh, titles. So probably I can have uh, names, and then from there I can have the names of the different people I want in the data frame. So let's see, names I can say uh, Mary, as I said earlier, and then let's say. John and lastly, yeah. and no, let me duplicate uh, Mary. And then I have the age. So age, uh -huh, I forgot to put them as. So then the next is I can have the age. And uh, I can 
hit the different age, so 2, 23, and then here is 2. So let me see once I run the example, if it will give me an output. Okay. <laughs> Ah, yes, so now I have this output. So now, how do you now check the duplicates in the specific row? So I'll have to now remove the duplicates in the specific uh, section. So I'll have to uh, give it the name that I want it to be removed from. So from there, you can be able to see I have removed the duplicates in the specific the duplicated rows in the specific uh, column, yeah. So I've realized I skipped a part uh, from the null values. So there's one thing about null values that I didn't talk about. That is how do you fill the null values? So with null values, you can be able to fill them using a uh, filner. So let me run this. Uh, huh. Let me run this code again and then try and fill the null values. So example two and then fill now. So with fill now you can decide whether you're filling it with, let's say you want to fill the missing data with two or I want to fill the missing data with zero. But then you can also determine, decide uh, you want to fill it with the average of the example. So since all of them are, no, not all of them are numbers. So let me move this. I have all of them to be numerical. And then I can decide to fill it with the average. So example, underscore, no. Uh, example two, then the mean. And that's what I want to fill it with. So the mean of the values is, uh, So this is the initial one that we have, and this is the one that you're using. And you can see the mean of each one of them is, it does the mean per the specific uh, columns. So the mean of this is 32, the mean of this is 43. So you can decide what you want to fill it with. The other way you can be able to fill it with is filling it with the previous value or the next value. So let me create a series on how you can be able to do so. So let me do another example. Uh -huh. Example three, and then create a series. So pd.series, and then I now fill it with a so three, so uh, pd, uh, none, and then I have three and then no, let me create five and then six. And for my example, example three, how does it look like? So, okay, Pera, it has no, this is how the numbers look like. And then if I want to fill, like if I want to fill the third number with the previous one, I can do uh, example three dot fill now and do a forward fill. A forward fill will fill with the previous value. Oh, sorry. Uh -huh. So a forward fill will fill, wait, I'm not sure it's not working. Uh, give me a second. If you have any questions, uh, be sure to post them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you, Dimitris, for the correction. I also think that was the issue because everything else was okay. Okay, so. You, you, if you want to now, you determine, so what you do is add the method that you want to fill with and 
this the method will be forward fill so with forward fill you'll see it will fill from this was the data that was missing so from there you can be able to check that then the next part is uh you can also do a backward fill a backward fill will do the same thing but from the previous one so i hope you're all on the same page from there i'm sorry i skipped that part so the next part is about uh, merging and concatenating so we have different examples that i have let me see how they look like so example one has this and then let's say i want to merge these two data sets so with merging i will have to now there are two methods that you can use to merge so there's the merge and the concat so pandas.merge or pandas.concat and using these two methods you can now determine which part you want it to be merged on which index you want it to be merged on and then you can set all these parameters on what you want to merge on where etc but the two main ways you can use is concat or merge so let's say i do so i have the data so let me create a third data frame and then i do pd dot merge and i select uh, example one example one and example two and uh, so i can match them because they're not the same thing uh, give me a minute let me look at what example one is and then example no let me just match the example one pd dot match it will take a while to come up with another uh, example one and then i merge both example one to a data frame so let me merge it to data frame three data frame two and then from there i read what data frame two has oh wow it has an error yeah series or a name oh this is a series i can merge series so let's see example two example two yeah so i can be able to merge i did not imagine uh, okay i have no idea why it's not working so i'm supposed to be able to combine this into one data frame uh -huh. give me a minute uh example let's go two this is what i have for example two and uh, let me use pd.concat and then example underscore two example underscore two i add it to a data frame and i print the data frame yep, giving me errors Okay, let me just create an entirely new example and try to merge it. Uh, or let me use the example I initially had. Mm. Okay, so my, yep, it's loaded. Uh, so let me just use the example I had initially to be able to show this. So we are on combining the data sets. So we have this, the first data frame, this is how it looks like. So the data frame is grouped into now uh, the employee and the group that they belong in. So probably Gary is an, is an account, is in accounting, so Stu is in marketing, etc. And then the second data frame has the same employees with now the higher dates, so the different dates that they were had and from there now you can be able to merge the two data frames and as the result you can be able to see how the merging has occurred so we are merging it the main part that we have is the example no the main data uh, the common 
row that we have, the common column that we have is the employee. So you can be able to see the employee is a common column. Yeah, I think that's the problem I had. And then you can be able to now merge the two data frames. And from there, you can get this as the output. So this is just a join of, uh, as I said, you can use pd.merge to just merge both of them. And this is a join on the employee. So you are, you're joining them on the employee side. The other way you can also be able to join is if you have uh, different uh, rows. And then this, this has the supervisor, the same data, but now this has now the supervisor. And the supervisor is for the different departments that we have. And you're merging it with the third data frame that we had. So in the first data frame, we're just merging the same values to different. So it's, we had a common column in, in all, and we're just merging it to the same. So just uh, matching it from where they belong. But from here, we have we also have the same thing, but we have less the group is less than like it's not directly like four people merging it directly to the other four people so it's uh, merging the supervisor and also merging the supervisor per the different categories or group so yeah you can read through all this how you can be able to merge different parts of the so you can there's like setting the index so like for instance you can set the index in the first data frame to be the employee and also set the index on the second data frame to be the employees meaning that will be now determine the determinant of where you're merging it at so you're merging it at the employee and that's it okay so i think we are running out of time i won't be able to explain all the other concepts but the other one is uh, concatenation. So you can also use concatenate to merge the data. I'm not sure why it wasn't merging on my examples, but you can be able to now use uh, concatenation to merge the two different series uh, together. So this is how concatenation works. Uh, I have this uh, data frame, the nine, and then from merging both of them, will add, so it will concatenate is just like adding it at the end. So if you're concatenating strings, it's the same thing that you do. You're concatenating strings with um, integers in a normal Python output. It's the same thing that you'll have here. So pd.concat and then it will just add at the end of it. The same thing, so as I said, you can be able to set the index from up here. So here you are setting the index to be the employee, to be the, the index of all of them. And then from there, you can be able to now see the other thing is to ignore the index. So if you already have the index, you can set it to ignore the index that you already have. And then it will now relabel everything. So instead of having it, so here it's just imported it as 0, 1, 0, 1. But ignoring the index will now be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It will just label the data as it comes. Okay, so this is about uh, concatenation. Appending is just adding the same thing as concatenation, just but with appending, you're just adding it at the end of of the of the series. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the statistics and uh, visualization. And I'm sorry, I. I think I'll run over time with five minutes. So with uh, statistics, the exploratory visualization and statistics is being able to now check on. Okay, so with the is now being able to understand the data that you have, checking on the means and everything. So this data set that I was I am showing an example of is a housing data set to for Boston and it indicates now like it has different rows and columns that um, indicate whether it's good whether how many people live by there and whether what are the different factors that affect the people living in that region so for instance the crime per the per capita crime rate by a town uh, dictates like how many what's the crime rate that happens in that town and these different columns uh, 
just show the different things that you can use to determine where you're living. And so the first thing, as I said, is to check what you, what the different columns you have and being able to interpret them. Then you can also see the shape of the data set. So the shape is just how many rows and columns the, the data has. Then the other thing is now looking at the details in depth of the different columns. So is there anyone that has a null or is there, what are the different data types in the different columns? Then the other method that you can be able to use is dot .describe. So using describe, you can find the mean, the uh, standard deviation, the minimum and the maximum values, and then this will determine the quartiles. So 25%, the lower quartile, mid, and the upper quartile of the, of the data set. So being, this enables you to now see the clear picture of where the data lies and where the different numbers are. Then you can also do it individually. It's not a must to do them uh, for the entire data set. So you can also do like for a single column to find the mean or the medium of a single column. You can also group them together and find using group by, you can be able to group them together by like the mean of, so you grouping the age and then the mean of the, the median value of, no, the mean of that, a specific age group depending on the MEDF, MEDV, whatever that is. And then the other thing is now being able to selectively apply the different, uh, the different things that you want to apply. So for instance, this you can apply a Lambda function to create a new column. So you can be able to see from this column, you can now create either it's you can create a boolean, so it's either true or false. For like, if the age is above, uh, if the age of X, so X is now the age. So if the age is uh, higher than 50, that's true. If the age is lower than 50, that's false. Then the other thing is now being able to determine the value counts of, of now the column that you created. So how many are true, how many are false, it is same. So uh, other than that, you can now go ahead and uh, visualize your data. So all this uh, unique is to determine how many unique values are there. And, if, and unique is for how many unique values are there. Unique is to now tell you what are the values that are there. Then value counts to give you the number of each of them. So like for Chase, the, it has two unique values and then what the values represent, they say. Then the last thing I can talk about is the visualization. So the, be the best visualization that I like is the correlation heat map. So this, this is a correlation heat map. It shows the correlation, the relation between the different columns and the different rows. So with like crime rate, you can see with crime rate, it's obviously high, but then if you're testing it with like the age of the, of the houses, it's something different. So it's, you can see whether it's highly correlated or low, and then determine whether you need to keep that in value or not. So you can also create, this is the correlation heat map on, on just a, a table, but you can also be able to create it using Seaborn. So you'll import a new library called Seaborn and now create the heat map, sns.heatmap, df.call. These others are just, um, uh, definitions on the different things that you need, but just using the dot call, you can be able to create a heat map. Oh, sorry. Being using the dot call, you can be able to comfortably create a heat map on the same. Yeah, so you can go and look at the different, also the different visualizations here. And I think you can now be able to understand what your data is, clean your data, and ensure that it is ready for modeling. Yeah, I think that's all from my end now. Yeah, I'll give it back to... Oh, wow. So, yeah. Hi, yes, I bet Hi, Maria. You so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for this session. Um, I see that we answered the question that we had during the sessions. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to post them now. 
Um, as I mentioned before, the session will be available on the Reactor YouTube channel. It should be there uh, later today. Um, yeah, I think that's it from our end. If you can take a one minute or two to fill in the survey, we really appreciate it and share your feedback on this session. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bethany, and thank you, everyone, for attending. And we hope to see you again in our, one of our next events. Okay, Bye-bye.